Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 50. Yes, everyone, episode number 50. This is Omari Richens here, the Public Health Millennial. Follow me on Instagram at the PH Millennial. I am so happy that we're able to reach episode 50 and I'm able to share so many great public health insights with you all. I hope that you have gained a lot of value from these episodes and I hope to bring you 50 more real soon and <laughs> you continue to learn and build off, off of these episodes and from everything that you're learning throughout your career to really navigate and get where you need to be. Thank you so much if you listened to any episodes before. Thank you so much for continuing to support. I really appreciate it. Be sure to subscribe, leave a review, leave a like, share it with a friend. Today's episode is a little different. It's a conversation with three wonderful ladies that I've had on the podcast previously. So definitely refer to the, episode, the, the part in the episode and you can refer back to what episode they were on and definitely go and check out those podcast episodes if you have not as yet. Um, but without further ado, thank you so much. And here's today's episode. Enjoy. <music> This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Hey everyone, thank you all for joining me. I'm so excited to bring you today's guest. She's been on the podcast before and I'm going to have a couple of other guests who've been on the podcast before, um, but I'm really excited to bring you this just because it's going to be our 50th episode and I didn't think that I would get to 50, 50 episodes and it's kind of crazy because this guest was on episode 14 when I was back in Alaska and now I'm in North Carolina and we're about to hit episode 50 and things are just going really well. So I'm, I'm really glad everyone stuck around and has supported me throughout this and thank you so much so today we have Yasmin Kashripur uh so Yasmin I, I know you've been on the show in episode 14 but just would you like to introduce yourself sure oh my god 14 seems like forever ago um so for those of you that didn't watch episode 14 or didn't listen to it uh, my name is Yasmin Kashripur um I am a I don't even know how to say my full role anymore. Senior <laughs> Experience Strategy and Transformation Professional. It's a mouthful of a title. Um, I work for Humana. I, um, I've been there for almost two years. Next month, it'll be two years. Um, my background, more so with public health, I graduated from Emory in 2019 with a concentration in behavioral science and health education. Um, and I had the opportunity to work with lots of different uh, public health organizations, CDC, uh, Children's Healthcare Atlanta, uh, Emory School of Medicine. So I've had the joy and privilege of working with lots of different institutions. And um, yeah, I'm excited to be here today. Yeah, well, thank you so much for, for joining and continuing to do the great things that you're doing in your career. And I'm just happy to, to have you on once again to just share your insights, because uh, I know you had a great story. So just just in case someone didn't listen to episode 14, which I definitely recommend you go back and check out. Um, how, how did you get introduced to public health? Yeah, so with um, my introduction to public health, um, like most students in my undergrad, I definitely didn't know what public health was, didn't expect to fall into a career with public health. Um, I actually was pursuing dentistry at the time and um, I was going to dental school and I was going through that process and I was recommended to take a couple of public health courses, um, you know, just some filling some electives. So I did and I absolutely fell in love with it. So I paused my entire process of applying to dental school and I redirected my attention to applying to grad school. Um, so that's kind of how I came to public health. And then I went to Emory and uh, now I'm here today. Well, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And everyone definitely check out episode 14 to, to hear her entire story. And we're going to hear a little continuation of that. So it would be great if you could probably like listen to that and listen to this one. After yeah, that. yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely made sense. Um, but I didn't even ask you, how are you doing? How, 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 how are things been doing since we spoke last time? You know, I think last time we spoke, we were, it was like the pandemic had just started or like maybe like we were a few months in. So um, obviously lots of change with you. I know you moved from Alaska, now you're in North Carolina. I think my life has been 
pretty uneventful, not as eventful as your life. I've, I'm still here in Atlanta, still love my home. I'm still here. Um, you know, work's been good. I think everyone is kind of picking back up again. You know, the world is kind of picking back up again. So business has been good. Things have been good. And, you know, I'm ready to start traveling again, getting back to normal. And, and that's kind of been my world lately. Okay, awesome. So I, I know you reached out to me on Instagram and you were excited because you got this new role. And I was even <laughs> more excited because you told me that throughout the interviewing process, the, the hiring managers saw this podcast interview that we did and it contributed and played a role in you getting the role that you're in right now. So I don't know if you just want to talk a little bit about that and maybe talk a little bit about the entire process of getting this new role. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah absolutely. So you know, where do you even begin? Um, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, a lot of people were starting to lose their jobs. And for me, I felt pretty okay. I felt pretty secure. Um, my company had been doing a lot of great things with COVID relief and, you know, job security. So I had felt really confident. Um, and then back in January, I was working on a pilot for the company and things were going really, really well. So we were like, the pilot's going to create new jobs. This is awesome. Like more people that are going to be able to find work. And then it kind of uh, turned the other way. You know, with, with the pilot came my, my job being eliminated. So my role through that pilot, um, you know, had led to an understanding that you know, we don't need this many people to work on these projects anymore. We can reduce the size of the workforce, save a lot of, you know, revenue on the back end and, and do things in a different way. You know, organizational effectiveness, trying to make sure we're being as effective as possible. Um, so with that, I, I ended up losing my job in February, which I think, you know, if for those of you that have listened to the last podcast, it was definitely my dream job getting out of grad school. I definitely loved every part of it. Uh, I'm pretty sure you had asked me like, what was a weakness? And I couldn't even think of one because I really did love my job. Um, so I was definitely devastated um, that I had lost my job. But I guess to preface that, at that time, probably a few months before losing my job, um, I had been, you know, sitting and talking with myself and thinking, you know, what's next? Like, have I hit a ceiling? Have I learned all I can learn from this role? You know, I'm coming up on the two-year mark. What, what, what more can I learn? And I realized that there, I had learned everything I could from this job, and it was time to start thinking what's next. So I sat down with myself, and, and I started looking and, and seeing what other opportunities were available to me, and, you know, nothing had struck my eye. And then a couple of weeks before I got eliminated, this role popped up that I am currently now in, and I was like, this is great. Like, this is so different. Um, and for me, like, I really trust my gut. I really trust my intuition. Like that is just something that I feel like is probably going to be something that carries me throughout my career. Um, so I definitely encourage people to trust their gut and trust their intuition. I had no idea I was going to be eliminated at all, but in the process, I had been applying to this role and interviewing for this role. So I ended up doing that and I got really excited about this job, just like my prior job. Like I was very, very ecstatic about it. And then the day that I was um, eliminated, I got the offer for this job. So my unemployment period was very short lived, thank God. Um, but that's kind of how the roller coaster works sometimes. Sometimes it's a blessing in disguise. And sometimes um, a no just means not right now. And rejection means redirection. So that's kind of the philosophy I had moving into it. Rejection means redirection. <laughs> I like that one. I like that one. That's awesome. Uh, so tell me, what was that mindset when you were finding out that this rule that you love isn't going to be a part of the organization anymore? So I think I was definitely, um, I wasn't surprised. I, you know, I never want to like make people feel like I was surprised by any means. I definitely wasn't because I just think COVID has hit every industry. Like, you know, businesses have shut down and every, every industry has taken a hit and a toll because of COVID. And I think that even healthcare industry has taken a huge hit. So, you know, with times that are changing, companies also have to change and restructure according to the times. 
So um, I wasn't surprised in any way. I actually, like where I'm sitting now, I see it as more of a positive thing. It, it was something that um, actually probably pushed me a little bit more to grow and not just stay in, in that spot. So um, looking back, I, I think it, it all happened for the best and, and uh, I'm really happy with the outcome. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad that your unemployment period is very short and that yeah. it seems seem to work out uh, really, really well. I was well. one of the lucky ones. <laughs> yeah, def definitely, definitely. So what, what was that interview process like, uh, I guess, switching rules in, in the organization? Yeah, so it was really funny. Um, the first, well, my, my boss had reached out to me originally and he was like, I just got like something for like a recommendation for you for this role. And like, I wrote glowing reviews. And I was like, oh, that's so nice. You know, this is before I even knew I was being eliminated. And um, so he wrote that and then he's like, yeah, they might be reaching out for an interview. Just, you know, keep an eye out. So I, of course, was just, you know, okay, it'll come maybe, maybe it doesn't come, who knows. Um, and I got an interview like two hours after. And then they were like, okay, we want to set something up for Monday. I was like, okay, this is really quick. It's a quick process. So I had my first interview Monday. It was very logistics, typical interview conversations and questions. And, and you know, being with the company, kind of switching roles within the company, it, it's very different. Like my first role was very like, what are the skills you bring to the table? Um, how are you going to uh, make this role um, new? And like, what are you going to add to it? Um, the role that I'm in now, you know, it, it required a little bit more of industry knowledge, industry understanding, a little bit more about Humana as a company and, and the programs that we do internally. So it was a little bit of a different structure, a little bit different, I would say, studying for an interview or preparing for it. So um, yeah, it was a very casual conversation. What have I done at Humana? You know, what am I looking for in, as the next step in my career? So it was very forward thinking kind of interview. And then my second interview, I got two days later, and that was the one where they had mentioned that, oh, we listened to the podcast episode that you were on. I was like, oh my God, you guys have done your homework. <laughs> so, you know, they knew everything. And I was like, my God, like, I'm already in the company. I can't believe they did this much research on me. So if you're listening, I'm pretty sure my team's probably gonna listen to the podcast. You know, now, you know, I know y'all stalked me. It's okay. So um, but it was honestly a, a great experience. The whole interview process was very professional, um, quick turnaround time. Um, people were very responsive and communicative. So I thought it was a great experience, um, just like my first one. Uh, very different, uh, having already been in the company, um, but all around great experience. Yeah, and, and that's awesome to hear. And you you said something like your boss gave you like a glowing review. Um, so yeah. <laughs> that 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 definitely helped, and uh, I'm sure that you did great work to get that that glowing review. So you you said something about this interview being more focused on like industry knowledge, and I know that mm -hmm. you're also like a, a early career professional. So how how did you build up this knowledge, like industry knowledge, and you also said like internal program knowledge to to be successful in your interview and just know when they yeah <laughs> yeah no that's a that's a good question um so for me i have spent the almost two years that i've been with humana um preparing myself um and that kind of mapping what my career could potentially look like um so i think part of the preparation and the mapping and outlining process is networking and making sure that you are making connections and building relationships with right people within the company that you're looking to move forward into. So for example, if someone is, you know, within some kind of industry and wants to move into more of a population health segment, like within our company, we have one, you would definitely want to make sure that you're making relationships with the right people in that segment. Or if you can't directly get to someone in that segment, who is someone within my circle that can help me reach out to someone um, that is within that segment and, and can help me. So I did a lot of networking. Like some of them were just blind as in like, I don't, I've never even spoken to the person before. And I just sent an email and said, you know, I'd love to talk to you. I know you're in this role. I would love to learn more about your role. And I know you know that I'm pretty, uh, 
brave, I guess is the right word. I will reach out to people. Um, I have no problem doing it. So I would say when you are within the industry and you're an early professional and you're trying to change um, roles, definitely make sure that you've done your research. Um, make sure that you are well networked. You're understanding the different programs and offerings within your company. Um, and you're establishing your brand. You know, I think part of it is uh, people that will speak on your behalf. So like my boss wrote that glowing review. I think you, you are the best person that can speak on your own behalf because you know everything that you're doing. So build that brand and build that representation for yourself so others can also speak to that for you. Yeah, that, that's some uh, great advice there. Um, so definitely take take uh, take note of, of what Yasmin said there. So see, tell me again, what was the name of your role? <laughs> <laughs> it's a mouthful of a title, but I'll give you like the long version and then I'll give you the short version and I'll kind of explain it a little bit more. But the long version is Senior Experience Strategy and Transformation Professional. That's a mouthful. And then the uh, shorter version is perfect experience program manager. And perfect experience is the specific program within the segment of Humana that I work with. So um, there's a longer version of it and then there's a shorter version of it. Okay, and what do you do in this role? Oof. So this role, perfect experience, just you know, for anyone that's maybe within the healthcare industry or insurance industry. Um, I'm sure a lot of companies have these in general all across the board and all across industries. Um, we are an internal facing um, program that specifically recognizes associates that have gone above and beyond and have served our members. So in any capacity, so we have different areas of the enterprise, people that are in the Medicare, Medicaid side of business, people that are um, an employer group sector, people that are in population health um, and working with social determinants of health. Um, so we recognize associates from an internal level that have these stories that they have worked with members of the community. And we recognize them and, and we um, share their stories with the whole company. Sometimes it's external with depending on the partners that we work with. Um, but our specific program of Perfect Experience, we are internal facing. So that's just one of the things we do. We also have a program that's called PSX with Disney. So part of what Perfect Experience also does in creating that perfect service for our members, a perfect experience for our members, um, is to make sure that our associates are up to date and trained and have you know, the proper knowledge to go out into communities and provide the best quality service they can to our members. So we send our associates to Disney World and we have a partnership with Disney and Disney sits down and, and does a whole course with them for a week. Um, and they just go through different areas of, you know, building a team, working with multi-generational teams, um, you know, different concepts that Disney itself as a company integrates into, you know, like the service that they provide to people that come to Disney World. Um, so it's such a great experience to see companies that have great, like, you know, like Amazon or a Disney that provide that perfect service to their customers, how we can also integrate that into a company like Humana, which is like a healthcare company. So, um, yeah, we do a lot of different things across the board, a lot of associate recognition, a lot of training and education, um, understanding how different areas of the business work. So I do a little bit of everything now, but it's um, very different from my last role. Okay, and to that effect, where, where, where do you think you need to grow or learn or have that opportunity to really develop skills that you didn't have in, in your last role in this one? So for me, my last role was Fantastic. It provided me everything I needed and to, to move to this one. This one, what I'm really looking to gain is um, I felt like I was getting only a bird's eye view in my last role. It was just like where I was and I, you know, was just looking at an employer group segment. That's it. I wasn't really looking at the company. I didn't really know anything about the company outside of where I worked. Now where I'm sitting, I'm getting a whole, like I'm on top of the mountain. I get to see how, what everyone across all the other mountains are doing. And I get the opportunity to work with our executive leadership team. So like our CEOs and then the retail team and pharmacy team, clinical team. So I've had the opportunity to work with 
lots of great leaders within the organization that I wouldn't have had the opportunity in my last role. So I'm hoping with this role, I really am able to get an enterprise knowledge, not just an industry knowledge anymore, but a whole enterprise. How does a healthcare company work as a whole with all these different segments? Um, and how does that work together to deliver to our members? Yeah, and I, I think that makes sense because I know you're doing more like service delivery, uh, health education stuff in, in your previous <laughs> role. And uh, mm -hmm. so now, now it's like more large scale, bigger, and as you say, enterprise level. Um, so that, that's cool. That's cool. And I'm, I I wish you luck in the new role. And I hope Thank that you, you. you you develop into it really well. Um, so before we started recording, you, you said that you're, you're almost ready to start back traveling. And I wanted to know, mm. where, where are you traveling? Are you traveling just within Atlanta, within Georgia, within the Southeast? Or how, how does that work? Yeah, so I'm sure you remember from my last role, it was like majority travel. Um, and that was travel mostly within the state, but sometimes other territories as well. Um, this role, my travel will mostly be to our headquarter office, which we are located in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so I'll be heading up there in a few weeks. We've got a big event coming up. So that is probably where majority of my travel will be. And then of course, with the Disney program, of course, Disney is in the Disney World um, Resort is in Florida. So um, maybe Florida a couple times a year. Um, but I think once everything kind of goes 100% back to normal. Um, who knows? We'll, we may make a road show out of this thing and just, you know, go and visit all of our award recipients that we get every year. I don't know. We'll have to see. But um, for now, probably just Kentucky and Florida being most of most of the locations I'm going to. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Um, I do look forward to reconnecting to see how that traveling does, does uh, I guess, to you know, when, when things do get back to more normalcy. Um, yeah. So what is something, I actually stole this question from another podcast I listened to. So they ask, <laughs> what's, what's something on your timeline that, that you're seeing? And like timeline referring to like Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever social media people use these days, TikTok, I guess. Yeah. So what, yeah. Oh God. TikTok. <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> We're not even going to start on that train. Um, I feel like I get asked at work all the time. Like, are you on TikTok? I'm like, what's TikTok? Like, I have no idea what that is. Okay, like, are you sure you're a millennial? <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah. They're like, are you a millennial? I was like, um, clearly not. If I'm not on TikTok, like, <laughs> no, funny. I don't know. I'm just not with the times, I guess. Um, but I do love Instagram and I do love LinkedIn. I, I probably am on, on those two the most. Um, so I would say the, I guess, thing that I'm seeing most and the conversations are like buzzing around for me in my world is probably inclusion and diversity. It's huge. And I'm sure all industries and all companies are having these conversations right now, especially with the time that we're living in and, and everything that's going on in the world. Um, so I'm sure these are conversations that are being had across the board, but I am loving the fact that they're coming and they're having these conversations and they're on the table now and people are actually willing to talk about them and be transparent about them. So, um, you know, we've, I've been in conversations recently around like gender inequality and race, um, culture, inclusivity, um, how to build a diverse team, how to, how to carry and, and have a multi-generational team that leads to success, ageism. I mean, like there have been so many topics around inclusion and diversity that have come to the table and I am all for it. Like, I love it. I love the topic. Um, I think it's something that, you know, we spend most of our time at work in our lives. So, um, you know, why, why wouldn't we bring that to the table? I know it's, kind of it was kind of taboo back in the day and they're like I don't know if this is a proper conversation to be having at work no it's a great conversation to be having at work so um I am loving these conversations we're having them at work I've seen them all over Instagram all over LinkedIn and um I think it's great that companies are, are recognizing that and acknowledging it and, and um encouraging associates to speak up about it yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I definitely think there has been a more, more sp out, outpouring of, of our diversity and inclusion and equity and just a focus on that, conversations around it, and mm -hmm. we need to just keep on pushing those conversations forward. 
Um, I did have a question that came up in my mind. So you you yeah. said that that you were networking while you were in your old old role, like being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Well, not being uncomfortable because you said like you're bold and you just have this conversation. So how how did you go? It can about be uncomfortable <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> how but how how did you go about reaching out to those people? Was it through LinkedIn or was it through like going through your company's website and knowing different people on different teams or how, how did that work out? Yeah, I would say it's a mix. Honestly, I. <laughs> I feel like people should expand their network in the way that works best for them. That would probably be my best advice is, um, you know, some people LinkedIn works really great for them. Some people, you know, word of mouth works well for them. Um, networking within the company, you know, every, I know with Humana, we have like an org chart that you can like see where everyone's kind of um, sitting at within the enterprise. So if you want to like blind reach out to someone, you can. Um, which that has worked good for me. Um, I think for me, it's been a combination of uh, blind networking, like point blank reaching out to people and being a little bold. Um, so that's one way. I think the other combination or the other part of the combination has been um, relying on the networks that I did build. So with Humana, we've had mentoring programs and, and you can you know find a mentee or find a mentor. Um, and those relationships have really served me well. I feel like I really try to take advantage of those. So I have been fortunate enough to have great mentors at Humana where I've been able to um, talk to them about what I'm interested in. And, and they're like, they're always willing to connect. Oh, I know this person in this industry. Let me, let me connect you with them. Um, so I think that kind of also goes back to building your brand. You know, if you're someone that you have a good brand and you have good representation and, and people that will advocate for you, I think it'll take you very far and, and definitely keep building it. You know, don't, don't just, you know, take that and, and move from it and, and never come back. Always remember where you started from and where you came from. Be humble and uh, take that humility with you as you move forward in your career. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that uh, information. So I just want to give you some space to talk about anything. If you did want to talk about anything or anything you wanted to share or anything like that. Oh, gosh. Putting me on the spot. I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, like, I'm just like, what do I share? Um, I will say this. Okay, so I have been reading a lot of leadership development books lately. I don't know if anyone on the podcast loves books as much as I do, but I think, Omari, I might have talked to you about it. Like, I set, like, a reading goal for myself for the year, and I'm, like, trying to finish, like, 25 books by the end of the year, and my boyfriend thinks I'm a nutcase. He's like, who reads that many books in a year? Um, so, you know, I, I enjoy it. You know, I'm, I may not be on my phone all the time. I'm not on TikTok, but I really have, I'm probably in the corner reading a book somewhere. So, um, I've been reading a lot of like leadership development books lately. So I would say for anyone that is like interested in growing themselves, um, you know, not, not only do you develop yourself for your career, but also yourself as a person, which I really do um, take very seriously as well. So I've been reading some of those books and like, there are so many great ones out there. Out there. I don't know if you've read any by Brene Brown. There's one called Dare to Lead. Oh my God, it's a great one. There's another one called Start With Why. And I think that one is, I haven't finished it yet, but that one is really like stuck out to me because we have, like I was just talking to one of my colleagues about it. I was like, do you realize how many meetings we get on every day? And like how many of them we talk about the work we have to do, but we don't actually get the work done until like after the day is over. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, why do we do that? Like, why do we have all these meetings? And like, why do we why do we do things the way we do at work can't we change that or like can't we like for me for example <laughs> my my coworkers are going to listen to this and they're going to be like you're crazy but I don't like to have meetings before 10 o'clock you know I like to get up in the morning I like to you know I'll maybe peep at my email but not really and I will go have a nice breakfast I'll spend some time you know reading a book pre mentally preparing myself for the day okay then I'll look at my emails around nine o'clock and then I'll start answering some of my emails but I always tell people, don't book a meeting with me before 10, unless it's like urgent and like an emergency. Like, I want to spend my morning getting stuff done because that's when I'm most productive. So I'm learning what works well for me and to have that set for myself. I feel like we start off the year and like 
we have these goals in mind, but we never follow through with it. I'm trying to actively set this goal and go through with it and say like, all right, Yasmin, like you will not accept meetings before 10 o'clock. That's your structure. 10 to three, you'll have meetings the rest of the day, you have to get work done. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but that's kind of, that was kind of a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I like that. Um... I think it definitely takes some self-awareness and you have to have the team of people around you that are able to say, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But I, I like that. I like for myself, because I, I usually don't have meetings before 10 either. That just happens that way. But I, I like to also start my day with like checking emails and like doing something before getting into a meeting. And I, I think it's so important to, to have our set ways that we like to do things and being able to communicate that with our teams and, and letting them know, okay, mm -hmm. like, during this time, don't set up a meeting with me because I, I just feel like I'm not in a place to get get the most out of those meetings or or, or whatever that that the case might be there. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that, and I feel like because because we we get pulled with pulled in so many directions from so many different things, it's great yeah. to just set aside time to do specific things that that you right. don't have to get pulled anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I just feel like, and I tell myself, I'm like, yeah, and why are you like, you, you spend four hours on a meeting talking about this, but like, where is the actual time to get it done? Like, I have to actually do the job. And then by the time I look at the clock, it's like six o'clock already. I'm like, oh, great. Like, you know, that's just how it works. So I would say like, for me, like something I've done to kind of combat that is like, I'm setting focus time on my calendar where like no one, like it's blocked off. So don't even try to book a meeting because I'm not going to attend. So, I mean, sometimes my focus time is an hour and I only get an hour in between like a bunch of other meetings. And sometimes it's like four hours where maybe I'm working on a bigger project and I need like to sit down and focus for that long. Um, so I've just been finding that so funny, again, back to organizational effectiveness. And I think with the pandemic, like people are just they're drained. They are so drained. Um, and it kind of goes back to mental health. Like, you know, that's what I have to do for myself. Otherwise I could work from six in the morning till 10 o'clock at night every day. So, um, yeah, that's been on my mind lately. I don't, I don't know why that just, I feel like that was appropriate. And maybe some other people are feeling the same way that I am and, um, feeling that, there are either not enough hours in the day, or maybe we just, you know, spend all day talking about things and don't actually get the work done. So um, it's interesting to see how your mindset changes from role to role to role. And uh, I'm kind of enjoying that part of my new job is just seeing how much I have grown from my last one. Yeah, absolutely. That growth is great to see. And um, that, that's awesome. Um, and I haven't, I, I don't, I don't think I've read, well, I, I haven't read the book, start, start with why, I think it's by si Simon Sang. Yes, yes, Sinek, yeah. Yeah, because I want to say like, I've, I've seen him on TED Talks and, and different things around that, uh -huh. but I haven't, I haven't read the book as yet, but I'm sure it's on my, my, my uh, ever-growing book list. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'll definitely have to add it, go push it forward to one of the top, one of the, the more, uh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> the top one. Well, yeah. I know you're reading a lot of health books, so like, let me know. But mm -hmm. I, I feel like everyone's, you know, we're all reading so much because like, what else are you gonna do in the middle of the pandemic? You know, mm -hmm. we're all, some of us, most of us are probably still home, so we still need something to do. So, um, yeah, it's, it's great to read and constantly keep yourself up to date. And I think with public health too, like always, you know, I'm, I'm reading some kind of research article or something that's new and coming out on how I can keep myself up to date. Because, you know, my role now may not be directly public health. Um, I'm still using a lot of the skills on public health, the program planning, the program evaluation, a lot of those. Um, but how do I still keep myself up to date? You know, I don't know what's next. Maybe population health is next. Maybe something else is next for me. I don't want to speak too soon, but you just never know. Yeah, and I was actually listening to it's my first book that I'm listening to. What is it called? Um, Range by David Epstein, and he, he talks he talks kind of about like how people who are very successful are able to take information from different like topic areas and bring it into their work, and mm -hmm. therefore they're able to like see things differently from the person that's kind of ingrained in this thing because they have this different knowledge base kind of thing. Um, I've, I've only I love got, that. Yeah, I've only just started it, but but I'm, I'm finding it very interesting because he's talking more about we need more generalists, but the society mm -hmm. has set us up as specialists 
but when you get when you become a specialist you're kind of like ingrained in one way and generalists allow you to to take knowledge from other places and yep. and, and and transform that kind of work you know yeah and i think public health you know speaking to that i think a lot of public health programs are, are um, really trying to i think with the times like companies are diversifying a lot of programs are trying to diversify too and not just have specific people concentrated on this but having like a a whole um, you know, industry-wide knowledge, you know, what is public health all encompassing, not just environmental health or, you know, global health or epidemiology, but making sure that you have knowledge across the board to apply yourself anywhere. So I think they're doing a really good job. Um, and I hope they continue to do that. And I encourage people to constantly learn and, and keep themselves up to date and uh, go in the direction, you know, don't be afraid of a challenge. I definitely, with the re rejection means redirection. I'm telling you, it's, it's, um, sometimes a no is just a no for not right now. That's what I'm, I keep telling myself, you know, don't be afraid to apply to something else. Uh, if you're maybe at the same point that I was in my career, you were stuck. Um, maybe you're, you hit your ceiling. Maybe you just like learned everything you, you were looking for in that role. Um, apply. I, you know, apply to a bunch of stuff. And if you get a no, maybe it's just a no for right now. Maybe two years down the line, you could, you could be in that role. Who knows? So I encourage people to constantly, even in the middle of a pandemic, um, time isn't stopping. It's constantly going. So make sure you guys are taking advantage of the time you are given and, and utilizing it um, to the maximum. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming back on and sharing all You're your welcome. insights and uh, everything that's been happening in your life and your new role. Uh, I look forward to hearing more, more about this when uh, things unfold and I guess we get back to some semblance of normalcy. Yeah. Yeah. So awesome. Thank you so much. Maybe we'll do it. Maybe we'll do an episode in person. Who knows? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm actually, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll let you know about that. But I know <laughs> next guest today is someone that I haven't spoken to in a long time. Just kidding. Uh, it's, it's my sister, <laughs> Alicia Richards. That would be shameful. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, she was back on uh, the podcast on episode four. So definitely go and check that out if you have not checked it out. And we actually just checked and it's almost been a complete year since that episode came out. So that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, this is episode 50. Alicia, introduce yourself, please and thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Alicia Richens. I am the Partnerships and Standards Manager at the Common Approach to Impact Measurement. And I work uh, freelance as a sustainability and social impact consultant here in Toronto, Canada. Uh, just like Omari, I was raised in Trinidad and Tobago. Cheers, cheers, cheers. And uh, how, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. Today is a pretty good day. It's pretty bright out here. The last week has been kind of gloomy. And, you know, I remember that New York Times article that got very popular a couple of weeks ago about this languishing period where we're between, you know, depression and well-being. Um, so just, you know, COVID fatigue. But I did get my first shot uh, of the facts last week. So feeling pretty optimistic. How are you? Yeah, and that's that. That's good. Um, that's good to hear. Uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well myself. A little tired across here. Been some long days at work, and then also just putting out. Well, I haven't been that consistent on putting out content on Instagram, <laughs> but but uh, uh, it's such a struggle. I think you're, you're more consistent than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like a lot of people tell me that I'm I'm doing a lot, or they always see my stuff, and I'm and like to myself, I'm like, I'm not even like at at sixty percent. Like I can do a lot Likewise. more. Just, just kind of lazy or just not accountability so you'll see how that goes everyone um but where where are you where are you located for people who might i am in downtown toronto all right cool cool so what has been new since we spoke oh boy i mean we spoke a year ago as an entirely new job i've changed jobs like twice <laughs> since the last time we spoke um so i was working at a local uh, family foundation here in toronto last year since then, I worked at the Toronto Region Board of Trade for a few months until I came into this opportunity. Right now, I work at the Common Approach to Impact Measurement, and I also kind of unofficially, officially launched my consulting biz. Okay, okay. And, and I know that you had a challenge. Well, t tell us about the, the, uh, the role that you had before the one that you're in right now. 
No, see what I can remember. So I used to work in the Trade Accelerator Program at the Toronto Region Board of Trade. Um, it's basically like a Toronto Chamber of Commerce, and it was a program geared towards um, helping businesses export and, and develop their export plans. So I was one of the program coordinators of putting together that programming. Okay, awesome. And I know you had a tough decision in uh, because the role that you had there was a full time role. And then the role that you're in now was a contracted role for I think it was six months at first. So you had to make the decision to either stay with this full time role, and you know, you're going to get benefits, you're going to get a, a salary and whatnot, or switch to this contracted role where you weren't sure if they were going to renew or give you a contract after that. And uh, you decided to go with the contracted role. So t tell me about the thought process and doing all of that. Yeah, that was really scary. Um, for context, you know, I had been offered this job that was full time, permanent, uh, benefits kick in, I think, at three month mark. Um, RSP, which is our retirement account, retirement account here in Canada, kicked in at the six month mark. So, you know, very, very secure um, kind of job, though, you know, you never really know how secure you are, regardless of that permanency of a contract. And what happened was I had this networking chat with the woman who is now my boss um, that I've been trying to chat with her um, on the side of my consulting biz stuff. Um, and I was, you know, just reaching out, talking about the work of impact measurement and the SDGs. And so we just had this networking chat literally like the week before that job started. And it turned into a job offer, well, an unofficial job offer um, that was really nerve wracking at first. Um, and so I went through an application process. I went, I went ahead with like starting the new job. Um, and yeah, really like what helped me make my decision was just knowing what really aligns with me personally in terms of my personal mission. I felt that it, it fit in along really a lot better with like the consulting work I want to do and just like the broader work of impact um, versus just kind of helping with export development, which is still important economic development, but not, you know, not ideal. And I, I also didn't really feel quite as challenged with the opportunity for, you know, growth and responsibility in that role either. So yeah, I took this new job that was like a five month contract, slightly more money, but no benefits. Um, and I'm really glad I took the risk. My contract was extended a few more months. And right now I'm currently in negotiation for rolling out into a permanent role with benefits and even more pay. <laughs> so if if someone was in your position where they they had to make that tough decision, what, what were the kind of things that you ranked or or made the deciding factor to say, okay, I wanted to to do this um this contracted role instead of like staying in this more secure role? Yeah, I think your financial situation is definitely going to speak into that. You know, um I'm very privileged I have no debt. So it was never like a oh my gosh, like how could I put myself in, in a more precarious position? I wasn't necessarily experiencing precarity in that sense. Um, and then just, you know, reflecting back to mission and vision, um, I think really having, there's a quote on a meme that goes around Instagram a lot. I forget the exact language, but just like not tying yourself to a particular job or company or title and thinking more about your own personal like mission and career development in life. And like, what is that story? And then it's it makes it easier to choose opportunities that align best with that. Yeah, so it really sounds like- Yeah, sometimes you have to take a risk and, you know, go with what feels right. Yeah, it's also about like personalities. I really, really enjoyed my conversation with this person in this new role. And I just felt like culture fit was a lot um, closer and stuff in terms of, yeah, just just the style of working. And I've, I haven't looked back. I haven't regretted it a single day. I'm glad to hear that. I knew I would be hearing it otherwise. So, so, so cheers. Uh, so what, what what were you looking for when you began doing these networking chats? Well, that networking chat was really more around um, my business development, right? So I'm really interested in figuring out how best can we assess our progress on the UN Sustainable Development Goals at an organizational level? And how can I help organizations translate these, this big global framework into what works for the organization um, while fitting the gap I felt that the government had, you know, because mm. governments, national governments have to make these voluntary national reviews. Um, that's basically like their own progress reports on the SDGs. And I just really felt like, I don't know, I don't know if the government really can tune into what's happening because it's really the organizations on the ground that are driving impact forward. Um, so it's interesting that I get to work 
Um, full disclosure, I still get to work as a consultant helping organizations with that. But then on the other side of the common approach, I get to work on the standard setting side of enabling the aggregation and collection and sharing of data to better serve the needs of the social impact sector. Okay, so so tell me what, what you do in your current role and how how that complements your business or anything like that because it, it yeah so my does. current role i'm the partnerships and standards manager so that means a few things i'm really the one in charge of nurturing our relationships internally and externally mm -hmm. um, engaging new organizations new people with our work and our mission and our vision helping them in the onboarding process to adopt or align any of our standards and also stewarding the development of the standards themselves right now um, at the staff level, we do that stewardship, um, but in our governance model going forward, we're going to be convening circles of stakeholders to do that work. And so my role would be like facilitating those conversations and the ongoing consultations with folks across the network as to how these, these standards should be developed over time. And then in my consulting work, um, I get to work with organizations similar to our members not not quite that kind of overlap yet. I, I don't I don't want to get into any conflicts of interest, um, but working with organizations similar to our members in like developing those impact strategies and processes, um, and more so like developing their strategy for impact that's more comprehensive. Um, you know, I love the the SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So like helping them to think of their impact just more holistically across the entire frame of the SDGs. Okay, awesome and. I'm definitely going to bring you back on the podcast or some other version of this to talk more about your consulting and the SDGs and the work that you do there, because I feel like there's a lot more we can dig into there. And uh, this is a, a brief period of time that we're spending together chatting here. Um, but how, how, how do you think, what, what skill sets do you think set you up to be to, for, for the person to want to say, okay, this person just wanted a networking chat, but they, they seem to have the skill sets and the drive or, or the know-how to, to do this type of work. Because yeah. the business that you're in also is a startup, right? Yeah, it's a startup nonprofit organization. Yeah. Um, I think passion for the work. Um, you know, I really enjoy talking about it a lot. And a lot of my work is about that public facing, being able to have conversations with people about it. Um, in terms of skills, Oh, like technical skills of analysis and communication, but also just those softer skills. Um, I think communication is also a soft skill um, of just like how best to communicate um, complex topics. I think, you know, people have a hard time wrapping their minds around the work that we do. So how best can we like communicate that work and nurture that work? And um, also just, I think I also had some experience across like, social impact work in different contexts and we define social purpose organizations very broadly so i think that was also very valuable you know i've worked in you know big international organizations small international organizations small local organizations um so really being able to tap into how people think and how people operate um, really helped a lot as well okay yeah that, that's awesome and uh, definitely passion definitely reaching out for those networking chats because if you didn't do that yeah, an initiative, that entrepreneurial spirit. Like I think in the last few months, you know, my boss, she's noticed me kind of taking on more responsibility um, and just taking on more and just feeling that um, autonomy across, over my work portfolio to just kind of do things. Like I don't need to ask permission. I just do and get things done and I let everybody know about it after. And then everybody's like, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. We got these new partnerships rolling. And that's just really exciting for me. Okay. And I think okay. back to your question about how that like complements, you know, the consulting work is just like, it's been so great in terms of building my network. Yeah, that is true. Network is your net worth. And especially if you're into uh, uh, entrepreneurship and stuff like that, I definitely, I feel like, because with the, a lot of the public health consultants that I speak to, a lot of them say that their clients are people that they had in their network prior before they went into consulting rather than getting new clients. It's, it's, and it's more likely for them to get clients through word of mouth than, uh, than anything mm -hmm. else. So Yeah, I find I get a lot of clients through like public speaking engagements and just being active online and sharing my thoughts and my story. That's, how, that's when people tend to reach out. 
Okay. And t- t- tell me about your public public uh, speaking engagements, because I know that you're getting paid some money for public speaking and, and getting into all of that kind of <laughs> Gucci Gucci games and stuff. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I did start off with an investment. So last fall, I signed up for this boot camp in um, public speaking for women of color called Women and Color. Um, which kind of really set me up with the foundations. And ever since then, yeah, I've been doing lots of public speaking with different types of organizations and groups and communities. Just last night, I had the honor of speaking with Seth Klein, who's the author of the book, A Good War. I think everybody should read it, um, particularly Canadians, about just the way we tackle climate, the climate emergency. Um, And so, yeah, it's been great to kind of get out there. I think my central message, I think, what helps a lot is having like your core central like message. And that's what I honed with the Women in Color Bootcamp of just like, for me, it's really talking about the interdependence of all of our issues. You know, that's why I love the SDGs because it touches on so many different things and the fact that they're all interconnected and we're not going to get any of them done unless we get all of them done together. So, you know, I was able to talk on, you know, gender equality panels um, last month of Women's History Month or back in February talking about environmental racism and just how all of these different issues are connected and intertwined. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been really great. You know, it's always nerve wracking, but really exciting. And I, you know, I just really love to grab up on those opportunities to speak more with people and get more comfortable at this thing. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a, a skill that you have to continue to build and just learn. And as, as you said, like finding out what, what your speaking point is and then going from there. And uh, yeah, so that's awesome. I'm glad that you're doing that. I'm glad. And yeah, well, one thing that, that I did want to say is like you, you're a huge person investing in yourself. Uh, I would say you're one of the people that invest in themselves more more than any other person that I know, which I, I love. Aww. Yeah, yeah, of course, and that's a compliment. <laughs> oh yeah, I think the best investment you can make is in yourself. You know, like stocks and bonds and ETFs and mutual funds, all that stuff's great, but like you are your best investment because like your your earning potential is just. <sighs> you know, if you're, if you're willing to invest and that doesn't have to be financial investment. It could be a time investment of just like really thinking about, you know, self-development. Yeah. And, and I definitely think it's important, especially in like this time where I feel like everyone was given a chance to just for the most part, sit down and like really figure out like what's important to them, what, what things they want to do moving forward and things like that during, during this time of this coronavirus and it's, it's coming I don't, I don't, I don't even want to say it's coming to an end because we have to get 70% of the world vaccinated and considering that all these uh, rich countries are just, <laughs> just keeping all, all the other, but that, that's for a whole different day. But if, if anyone is interested in like inequities in vaccine distributions around the world, look at, look up the COVAX program and just see how, how, how late they started that program and how bad it is because we, we in public health have focused on prevention and that was just not a good example. But anyway, going, coming back, coming back to, to you. Uh, so I, I just think like developing and, and investing in yourself, whether that is books, courses, um, masterminds. Courses, mentors, masterminds, programs. I mean, there are lots of um, scholarships and bursaries out there as well. So like for the Women in Color Bootcamp, I, I never paid full price. I applied for a bursary and I got it. Um, so there's lots lots of support out there as well and coaches coaches are great too okay definitely so definitely like tap into yourself like as as Alicia said uh the ROI of investing in yourself is a lot higher than invested in stocks and bonds um I I wouldn't suggest investing in bonds unless they're like really really old to be honest (laughs) (laughs) but the stock market is also really high right now so I do I don't like unless you know what's going on don't invest Unless you're going to invest for a long time and invest consistently, then you can do that. But that's for who. Yeah, different- investing is a long, it's a long game. You're not yeah. looking for returns tomorrow. If you're trying to do that, I have no advice for you. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah. this is not. This is not any financial advice. We are not um, financial planners or not anything like that. Advisors least. or anything like that. Yeah. So, um, what what is something that you've been seeing on your timeline? So this could be something that you're seeing on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Facebook. Snapchat, wherever people see people. Honestly, it's exactly what you were just talking about, you know, vaccine inequities and vaccine apartheid and the fact that, you know, it's, it, it for me mirrors our climate challenge. It mirrors all of our other sustainable development challenges of just like this pandemic is not going to be over 
until we get 70% of the global population vaccinated. You know, it's not enough to just get vaccinated here at home because then all these other variants develop. And I mean, you're way more versed in this, you know, than I am. But, you know, these variants develop and our vaccines can't ch can't challenge them. And we're just going to be constantly going through these waves um, here in Ontario, Canada. You know, we've been in different versions of full lockdown since last November, and it's very frustrating. But if we're just, this is just what life is going to be like if we don't actually take care of everyone all together and understand that we're in this all together. Like this, this virus came from some little town, you know, from some little town and, it, and it's impacted all of us across the entire globe. There's no way we get this done unless all of us, all of us are taken care of together as well. Yeah, that is absolutely true. And just because we're speaking about it, speaking about it right now, I'm going to make a post on the COVAX at some point in time, just talking about like the vaccine inequities. Shameful. Yeah, because... And just the poor planning, even here in Canada, planning against it. And, you know, we had to end up tapping into the COVAX funds for Canadian vaccinations, which was just atrocious politically to have to do. Um, It's just, it's just piss poor planning. Yeah, yeah, cause, yeah they, they, cause what what I've learned from it is the bilateral agreements were just really bad because they're in favor of the the richer countries because you can invest more money at the earlier stage of of it because it's more risky when you invest earlier on but you're guaranteed more vaccines so the other countries who don't have enough money have to wait until the later stage, but Covax is like kind of multilateral so like it's go, it goes into a pot and then from there the vaccines go out. But what happened was the bigger countries made their bilateral deals before Covax was like developed into anything. So they already had those deals and then Covax came in later. Uh, so that's essentially like a brief yeah, over. and there are all these IP protection things that stop you know poorer countries from developing and manufacturing their own versions of the vaccine, which is just honestly ridiculous. Like India is like the biggest producer, <laughs> yeah, they're in the biggest mess right now. It's it's sad. Yeah, correct, correct. And if if you want anything else on like vaccines, look up Tanzania. Tanzania has been going through a crazy time with like the president not believing in in COVID at all. Um, it's, it's, I, I, I want to say he passed away. The president passed away and there's a new president that took over and she still doesn't believe in COVID. So wild, wild times in some places in the world. So I say that to say, like, keep on wearing your mask, keep on educating people, keep on fighting for equity uh, everywhere and uh, anywhere. Uh, so let's keep on it because it's a global game. Um, COVID-19 isn't, isn't going to be the first, isn't going to be the last pandemic that affects us. And it's, it's definitely not going to be the, I, I hope that it is the last one to affect us this bad. I hope that we invest in the prevention methods and the systems to really um, address it before it becomes as poorly and also have the leadership to do that as well. Um, yeah, exactly. I think COVID-19, this whole experience, I hope we take the lessons from this experience of dealing with a pandemic in terms of how do we get to just recovery, how do we get to a green recovery, and how do we use this to really propel us forward to get to those 2030 targets, because that's, that's pr pretty close by. And, you know, the, um, the ambition for climate action politically around the world is still not big enough. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. It it's crazy because we we've been who who's the uh is it Al Gore? Is that his name? The the green guy who ran for president. We've, yeah, been, yeah. we've been talking about all these issues for decades now, and decades. no one has been taking it on. And then these issues just continue to exacerbate. Uh, it, it's really a, a interesting world that we live in. But as we all know, the people that make money make money off of these these sorts of things. Yeah, but it's also just about acknowledging the, the emergency that it is, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that book that I mentioned, A Good War by Seth Klein, I absolutely recommend it. You know, he really talks about the way that we mobilize to deal with World War II, you know, the investments put in, the crown corporations developed, the jobs created, the planning. Um, we didn't do it perfectly. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of justice work that did happen and didn't happen. Um, but, you know, like we need to treat the climate change like like a wall we need to like suit up and spend that money and you know set things up and take care of people on the way yeah absolutely uh i guess quick quickly what what are some tips that people can do in their personal lives to i guess make try to make an impact around climate change talk 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 to each other talk to your locally elected representatives um just have those conversations and advocate for 
those changes, you know, those individual things of like how you can live more sustainably. That's all great and well and nice. And I hope a lot of people do that. But, you know, we only get to the scale we need if everybody's doing that. And the way to get everybody to do that is to change policy, to make it like that's just the mandatory way of operating. And how do we get there is having conversations with each other, having conversations with family and friends and communities. And yeah, like I've been learning in the last year just how easy it is to get access to your, you know, your city councillor here in Canada, it would be your, your provincial minister and your minister of parliament. It's really easy to get access to them, like looking at them and they respond because you tag them, uh, booking meetings with them, writing them letters. Um, yeah, so just really talk, talk widely, talk deeply and engage. There's some really great resources about like how to talk with people. Um, in Canada here, there's Youth Climate Lab has a card deck that helps you like navigate those conversations. Um, so yeah, just talk and read more. All We Can Save, another book I absolutely recommend, an anthology. Okay, well, well thank you for sharing those books. Thank you for sharing that information on talking and, and I just wanted to caveat the question that I did ask with saying that, yeah, we always do say, okay, we have to make personal decisions, but we understand that these personal decisions aren't making the impact that we need. So we do need the systems levels and the policies um, around it because similar example, recycling. Um, recycling, what they, they, they made the system where recycling is, they made the plastics and they're like, okay, everybody could recycle and we can do this. But they knew that the system of recycling was broken because everything is exactly. not going to be recycled. And then they tell us as consumers, oh, you got to recycle, you have to reduce things. But then when all the corporations are still producing the things, we are still going to use it. So they're putting the blame on us when the policies are not there to stop it in the first place. So that, that's exactly. another it's so simple here in Toronto. So our recycling facilities can't recycle black plastic. You know, a lot of restaurants give you your takeaway in black plastic containers, yet restaurants are allowed to import black plastic containers. It would be so easy to just ban that, require them to use other plastic that's, you know, um, that fits into our recycling system here instead of just having just way more landfill waste. Yeah, absolutely. Just little absolutely. things like that. It shouldn't be that political. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, a lot of things that shouldn't be that political. But uh, so so is life, right? So, um, well, thank you so much for coming on, for chatting for a bit with me. Definitely bring you back on to, to share more about SDGs and everything like that. And I think SDGs are important. Definitely falls into public health. There's a lot of public health in there. As you said, SDGs are very broad. Public health is very broad. Um, if you look at a lot of the things in the SDGs, it, it definitely aligns with a lot of things that public health people are doing. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing all your information. If someone wants to connect with you, where would they be able to connect with you? Uh, LinkedIn is easiest. You can just look me up, Alicia Richens there. Um, my handle on Twitter and Instagram is Alicia Mawena, which is my middle name, A-L-I-C-I-A-M-W-E-N-A. -E I'm actually right, planning to write a blog post about that someday. <laughs> okay, and your website? Oh, AliciaRichens.com. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, of course, of course. All right, well, thank you so much for hopping on. And last but not least for the 50th episode, we have lovely Deville Ma. Uh, she was back on episode five, uh, so a very long time ago, almost a year ago. And uh, I'm just really glad that we stay connected. I'm able to reintroduce you to, to what Lovely has been doing and all the great stuff that she is doing. So Lovely, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, y'all. My name is Lovely. Um... Looking forward to sharing more about myself during this call, but it's I'm so good to be back and thank you so much for having me. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. So, so tell us a little bit about what, what your, your public health career journey up to what we spoke about last time. So your last job that you were in. Oh yeah, so for those who probably did not watch before, just to quickly onboard you, uh, so I worked for Impact International. It's a healthcare research firm. A lot of what I was doing was on state Medicaid research and public health policy. Um, so ever since then, I moved to a firm called Deloitte. It's a healthcare advisory and consulting firm serving six continents. And we have a lot of staff um, with different talents. And it's a very diverse place to work in from a talent perspective and also globally within the world. So um, definitely there's a lot that you could do at Deloitte so you just have to be open to the type of work that's there. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that is awesome. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with Deloitte. Uh, I'm not too sure if they're familiar that public health people can get into the work. So like, I'm excited for you to just share a little bit about your journey and, and, and the skill sets and stuff that you you did, that you gained to get yourself into there. I don't know. Did I ask you how, how are you doing? How, how are you doing, lovely? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm doing good. Uh, it's following work day. It's quirky, but you know, it keeps us going and keeps us pumped, you know, public health. Yeah. And where, where, where are you located for work? Right now I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm serving a client out here. So yeah. Okay. I guess awesome. And how, how often uh, do you travel for work now? And I guess after the pandemic, if, if it's going to change any, any differently? Uh, changing it differently, I think um, right now the firm is just working virtually, but I'm sure there's plans to move towards a more in-person travel as the pandemic lifts. Okay, and that, and that makes a lot of sense. And I'm like, I, I know that you're always a busy person doing a lot of different projects and no. being tied into a lot of different things. And one thing I, I know that we didn't talk about in the last episode was that you you like to dance. And you, 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 didn't, you didn't mention that. So tell, tell me a little bit about the, the type of dance you're doing and like how, how you got into dancing. Oh yeah, it was back in college. I had met a good uh, friend of mine he introduced me to salsa dancing and Latin dancing in general. So ever since then, I took my first class, fell in love with the, the whole genre, um, started dancing just locally within my university. And then that moved towards local ballrooms across the, across the county, and then shortly across the state, and then shortly across nationally and then globally. So I started trying to um, see kind of like my local roots and then I was like oh I want more and it just became a sprint and a spurt so I've been traveling a lot for that but you know of course it scaled back uh, with COVID and now we're kind of moving towards this virtual first uh, approach just kind of like with COVID so a lot of that has transitioned to online classes I still stick with my dance teachers till still to this day um, I will say I am rusty, but I think I still got it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet I bet you still got it. I bet you still got it. That, that is dope. And I just wanted to touch on that because I, I know, I, I guess I didn't like explicitly say, okay, you mentioned this in the last episode, but I thought it was cool. And I think it's always interesting to, for people to tell like their outside hobbies and passions and the things that they do there. And also mm -hmm. I'm, I'm reading this book, which I mentioned with the other guests that are on today's episode. Um, range by David Epstein, I think I think it is, and it really talks about taking knowledge from different domains and bringing it into your work. And dance is something that you probably picked up a lot of untraditional skills and skill sets, and and you could introduce those kinds of thought processes or whatever you you learn through dancing into the work that you're doing, and it might it just creates an, a better overall overall person, you know, and professional. So, yeah, and I highly recommend anyone check out that book. Yes, yes. It sounds like a phenomenal book. I need to read it. If you could just send me a copy, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So how, how did you exactly like position yourself to get this new role with Deloitte? Because I know before you were enjoying your, your, your role that you were in. So, so tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I think it was just a stroke of just um, trying to keep my LinkedIn updated as much as it could be. Um, a lot of the times I try to keep my resume as published and polished as it could be and updated as well. So I included that as an attachment on my LinkedIn. And then I made sure to include all of my accomplishments from my positions. So since my LinkedIn was so thorough, a recruiter was able to read a little bit about me, do his initial screening, just kind of get a sense of what my responsibilities are, where my potential could go. And then he essentially reached out based off of his screening, I guess I passed. Um, <laughs> and then from there on, um, he did a 15 minute screening interview um, just to get a sense of where I fit and if I fit with the role that he was looking for. And without that, I honestly couldn't say that, I don't know, maybe I would have ended up on a different road, but without that LinkedIn page being there, it, it helped me get there definitely. Yeah, absolutely. That that speaks to actually like being proactive about putting yourself out there, updating your things. So everyone knows what you're doing, keeping up to date mm -hmm. with the like the professional 
sell professional brand and from that people do do actually reach out to you and and you do get those opportunities and like as you said like who who would have no, known you have been going to Deloitte like that that is not something that's like that's like me saying I knew I would be going to Alaska like you, I know. <laughs> you, you just didn't know it was going to happen and it's just amazing to see how other things work out but even from the last time we spoke we, we know that you're just a very proactive person that's really putting yourself out there, always building relationships and doing doing the best to put your best professional foot forward to get you where you are. And I think that's an example that a lot of people, myself included, uh, should should definitely just, just take a lot from that because you're doing great stuff. And I, I just look forward to seeing what you do uh, in, in a couple of years. I know it's, it's going to be amazing. And uh, I know we spoke about some dreams and aspirations in the in the uh, earlier podcast. I don't know if they've changed, but I know that uh, there's a lot of, of potential there. So so I just really look forward to that. So so tell me more about working with this recruiter. And you before we, we started recording, you were telling me about some different recruiters and I had no clue what you were talking about. So can you explain that? To yeah. Me? Well, thank you so much. Just for that very kind compliment. And I, I think it just goes to say that the firm really does try to include more diverse practitioners so that they can bring more talent to the firm and just like me, give me an opportunity to bring my skill set there. So I think just overall, the recruiter that was looking for me, he was a diversity recruiter. Um, so he was looking for different mindsets that could come to the firm, whether if it be technical, public health related, um, what have you, business process design, learning design, those things. So he was looking for more of like a state health role. And I had been working with a lot of states on just Medicaid research. So there was a good fit there with working on state Medicaid and also tech role opportunities. And that's what he was looking for. And since I had the experience to do so in that 15 minute screening, he was like, okay, he asked me a few questions. Um, of course, I gave my, my honest answers on like how I could contribute to the role and using the information that I knew. And then from there on, he sent me on to an internal higher ed um, to work with. So after that, I, I worked with another division head to kind of get an understanding of what um, the, the opportunities could look like at the firm, just on a broader note. Um, and of course you have that 15 minute segment where they ask you questions and then the other 15 minutes you should have questions definitely to ask them. Um, and that'll give you a better sense of like what the firm could potentially give to you as an opportunity and how you can kind of create more opportunities for yourself as a practitioner. And then there's another tier of interviews where you um, start doing uh, what they call case studies. And they give you an example pro pro problem. It's a 30 minute interview. And you get this case that you have to solve on the spot. And no matter what, it's just showing your thought process on how you'd work with a client. And I think mine was just like, and you can find um, interview examples that you can look on and practice yourself if you're looking to pursue some types of firms or pro programs like these. But um, you can look up online and they'll say like federal, state federal health client wants to open up a new uh, market analysis on XYZ topic. How would you go about starting this discussion? And so you should have talking points and just kind of like different things that you wanna cover, get your questions answered for, and then you have to go through on a quantitative level and a qualitative level, how you'd answer those questions. And it's really to show how you would act as a consultant in that role or whatever interview, whatever role you're interviewing for. That, that's awesome. And yeah, and, and I feel like the book, the same book range, it, it speaks to like bringing together a diverse body of people working on projects. So, so mm -hmm. you're not, so you, you, so everyone can bounce off different ideas. They have different expertise. And from that on traditional analogies and things come up and they're able to solve issues unconventionally and usually more efficiently than, than if a team was just proficient in one specific domain. So, so that, that is awesome. And I love, I love the idea of case studies. Um, I think that 
we need to do more of that in public health. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, no, no lie, no lie. But, but I, I think it really speaks to the, the possibilities of the skill sets that you gain from doing public health work and how it could translate to a bunch of different roles that we, we probably don't even know about uh, to this day. So I know we can't talk about specific projects you're working on, as I do still want to keep this friendship going and uh, keep <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. so so what are some skill sets that that you use uh in in your day-to-day -day roles oh yeah i i think especially with today's covid uh, pandemic climate there's a lot of challenges that we're facing like isolation loneliness um trying to keep data centralized in one place considering like now it's a virtual first um so thinking about dashboards and kind of more connected health tech resources um, I picture myself in that arena trying to, you know, use my context of public health and then tie that into data. So trying to collect more measures um, from that, you think about skill sets of like learning instruction and design. You also think about uh, data analytics. You also think about strategy, just trying to help teach users how to use the systems you build but then also working with your executives to get an understanding of what needs do they really need to have with these systems and also taking it even further to answer the question of, are you making an impact at the end of the day? And that's what the firm tries to strive for. And also while we're thinking about impact, you wanna make sure you quantify and qualify all sizes or impact that you're trying to do. So there's always going to be a tech component associated with these things. And that's what the firm tries to give is more tech oriented solutions. But there's also the advisory side where we can build up strategies to um, do more business process design, or we can stand up new centers for clients, um, give them proposal ideas on how they should go about a specific subject matter, and then really build that to life so that they have a strategic plan to go ahead with build that build out whatever that opportunity is and then they can go for it so it really depends where you want to get involved there's lots of opportunities to get involved whether if you're a public health person or you just like having public health contacts or you're not a public health person at all but you're looking to get involved in more public health work and you can learn from other practitioners who are higher up above you we have specialists we have masters who are in their trade um, so they can kind of coach you and you get a coach and a mentor and you get your manager. These are all different roles that you work with and vice versa so that you can learn, grow as a practitioner and give back to your clients. So I would say a lot of different skills, but I think mostly the number one skill that I'm owning right now is my own understanding of technical expertise and really where that comes from me as a public health leader and what solutions that I want to provide, knowing that this may be the best public health, in, public health out outcome for frontline workers, but then I take that outcome and then I tell the leaders like, hey, this is what frontline workers want to have. This is what they need to have to do their job and excel. And then with that understanding, they can say, okay, well, let's develop a process around it and let's keep talking about it and having these conversations. Yeah, that's awesome. Th thank you for sharing that, and uh, yeah. I appreciate that. How 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 would you uh, advise someone to get if, if they wanted to, I guess, get recruited or just get into one of these firms? What, what advice do you have looking in, looking out from the inside now? Yeah, I would definitely say number one, leverage your social media because that will get you as far as like tech can take it. If you have the right keywords in your bio, if you have open to work, just even put on your LinkedIn, just to say I'm open to consulting roles or open to whatever role you're trying to look for. It's easier for recruiters to find you. And then the other aspect is you should be looking for recruiters as well because they're hiring and they're looking for people. But at the same time, if you can make a case and show to them that you really fit in that position, they're willing and open to hear you out and share more about the position or even connect you to other positions that you may be a better fit for that they're looking for people to fill. So 
definitely, I wouldn't show a blind eye to tech. Really leverage your LinkedIn professional profiles because that's what they're there for. It's to help recruiters and also help you get ahead. I 100% I agree with that. And I like that you added the part of you can reach out to recruiters as well. And I think people forget that a lot of the time. So uh, definitely take that advice because uh, you never know where you might end up and, and optimize your LinkedIn profile for and make sure that it's ready. So if a recruiter does land on it, they, they're going to hit you up for, for a, a next conversation afterwards. Um, yeah. Oh, so, yes. So what, what is something on your timeline? So this is something that you've been seeing on like Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever people are, are these days. So yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, for me, I follow uh, Harvard Business Journal on LinkedIn. Every time they post a new article, I get a ping on my work cell and my personal cell. So I know like, okay, I gotta go look at this. And the, the article was about being an ally and it was talking about how to support practitioners all around like even if you can't help someone a hundred percent but at least help them get connected to the resource that they need support from and just being a listening ear especially during covid because a lot of the times we're having that siloed issue like we can't make the relationships that we want to because the world's virtual and then secondly um there's just it's hard with networking, to be honest, to really connect with people, show passion on a day to day, you're burned out through Zoom, all of those things, you know. So I'd really encourage folks to take a step and just say like, hey, I'm here to be your ally. Like, even if I can't support you, I'm, I'm open to hearing you out, you know, and just being that that listening ear who's encouraging and willing to sponsor you to get ahead. I think that's the best thing that we need to have, especially during this time. So I'd encourage folks to read that article. It's called Be an Ally by HBS. Okay, awesome. I, I don't I don't think I am following them on LinkedIn, so I'll be sure to go and follow them after this. But uh, that is great. Yeah. I, th I think uh, just having conversations, having open spaces for people to to have and encourage and, and be open and transparent about these issues are, are so important. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Definitely, definitely. And the firm's very big on like having those conversations too. So always look for work environments that are very supportive for you um, and always encouraging to you as a practitioner and also work on your professional and personal development as well. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Like in today's day and age, you need to find work or where, where companies are really aligned with your values and are doing the things to really forward equity, diversity, inclusion within themselves as well as in the work that they're doing. So yeah, that, that's a key point there and um, something to look for when you are looking for a new job or a new role. So yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And um, I'm, here's a little space for you to talk about anything that you wanted. Okay, okay, okay. I think um, mostly I would I would give a shout out to the people who are interested in public health work. If you're curious, you're curious, go for it. Like no one's gonna stop you. I, I know my first research project was in forensic science. Now I'm in tech. It's still public health at the end of the day. Anything that's health related, like even if you're just curious about it, like if you're curious about drug policy or just drugs in general, pharmaceutical chemistry, social behavioral sciences, just anything remotely health. I just encourage you to get curious about the ideas. Do Google searches on companies who do that type of public health work and see and reach out to folks on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on I can't tell you how many platforms we have. There's a new audio one that you can log in and jump into rooms. Clubhouse. Club room. Clubhouse. Clubhouse. Yeah. <laughs> you can even do clubhouse. Um, you can even do clubhouse and just like chat with folks and find their Twitter handles. I'm new at this. And I'm just like, oh, a Twitter handle? What's that? So, <laughs> you know, so you just try to find people who can relate to you and you relate to them on their interests, to be honest. And then just have a candid and open and professional conversation about where you want to go, where you see yourself, what are your true interests, and see and offer yourself to maybe see if you can get involved in some type of way, even if it's in a volunteering stance, 
waiting for a position to open up for you to join. I think once you just kind of find that stepping stone to get to the right place, then you find your home, then it makes it all of the worthwhile. As I know, Mari and I have just been on this trail of public health and we're just blazing, you know, and we're trying to make it work for us. So I say that to all of you, like we got there, we're an example, we're shining. At least I think I like to shine. But at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, it's public health and we all have our own contributions that we want to make. And just know that that's your brand and what you want to be known for at the end of the day. That's a part of you and your interests should come out with that. So that's my advice to everybody out there listening. And yeah. Yeah, well, thank, thank you so much for that. that, that that meant a lot and I feel like you are shining and we all need to take the steps and be proactive and there are just so many social media and other channels for us to network and build relationships and learn and be curious and figure out new things and find find out about things that we didn't know about earlier and just build that into our learning and our process and our experience so I appreciate you sharing that and as you said like you you had no clue you'd be in tech and I feel like they're going to be a lot more tech and public health related jobs in the future so everyone like just look out for for these new opportunities that are going to come about so yeah thank you for sharing that um uh, last but not least i guess where can people connect with you for me linkedin feel free look at my page see an example of what it looks like feel free to mirror it take the language go for it not all of it but you know <laughs> <laughs> just use an example and just work from there and if you feel like you um, need some additional help or preparation on interviews, resumes, um, case study work, feel free to reach out and happy to help you if you need recommendations on different jobs, public health or non-public health related, and also um, just in, in the world of work in general. I know I transitioned from being a grad student, uh, well, graduating undergraduate student two years ago, um, and the last version was my story. So if you're transitioning out and you're graduating now, feel free to look at that as well, but connect with me on LinkedIn and happy to help. Yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely going to check your LinkedIn profile after this to, to, to check it out. Cause I know, I know I've been on there, but I haven't like scooped it out in, in depth. So I'm going to do that afterwards. Uh, so that, <laughs> I'm looking for yours. <laughs> I haven't updated mine in a while, to be honest. I'm on it right now. <laughs> Uh, but, but thank you so much thank you so much for coming on and sharing some more insights and I'm definitely going to take you up on some of that um case study things I have I have some ideas as you said that so I appreciate you sharing that and yes. on, until next time take care lovely until next time thank you so much I appreciate you all for tuning in and supporting me on to, to this 50th mark I appreciate it a lot and I, I know that uh, a lot of people have gained a lot and I would like to say that I have gained a lot from this so thank you so much for just tuning in and listening and being with me as we improve and we give you all great content that helps you navigate your public health career be sure to subscribe leave a like leave a review thank you so much for my returns public health millennial out